This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today's service call is on a walk-in freezer that's not working properly. And let's go ahead and pop back to the back of the coil. And we are frozen up. Nice and thick. So, um, they're still moving some product for me. We're gonna hop onto the roof, check out some stuff up on the roof, and then uh, get down here and we'll get this defrosted and then finish diagnosing. Call it whatever you want. When I, you know, I like to be as organized and as efficient as possible. So, you know, I used a rope to get my, my tools and stuff up onto the roof. Um, and then when I'm done, I like to leave my rope down there, out of the way so nobody's tripping over it. And then I like to uh, rope it up here so that way it's not sitting on the ground getting dirty or in my case wet because there's morning dew and frost everywhere. This is my walk-in freezer unit. We're gonna dive into that right now. Um, on the rope though, what I will do, I'll pull it up just to show you guys, is I use a, uh, a hook on mine so that way I can rope up. I just set all my stuff down there. This uh, hook's made by Klein, I think actually. I believe it's a client. Yeah, it's Klein, Klein Industries. I'll put a link in the video show notes, but I really like this because it pivots, tied on one end. Yeah, I got a crazy looking knot right there, but it works. And, uh, but you know, I like to leave it down there so that way if someone else comes here or if you go downstairs without thinking about it and you bring something else up, the rope's already down there. You don't gotta climb back up, you know? It's just the silly things like that that make my day go easier because, you know, we're, we're, we're better prepared basically. So, but I'm always concerned about the customer, so I'm making sure that it's not in their way to where they're gonna trip over it, that kind of stuff. So we have three condensing units for walk-ins here. And sometimes it can be kind of tricky to tell which one's which. Now, if they're labeled, which, you know, when you install them, you should probably do a decent job of labeling them. But this one's labeled walk-in cooler. It looks like we could probably label that with a paint marker. This one's labeled beer walk-in. This one does have some labeling on it over here and it's labeled walk-in freezer. But something as simple as that helps the next guy once you've figured it out. Now, if there's no labeling up here, then there's some other methods, okay? Um, we can do some obvious uh, assumptions because the suction line is iced up down at the evaporator and we could walk in and look at the other ones. Is there any ice on the evaporators? No, okay, so it's a pretty safe to say this is the walk-in freezer, but we can go further and diagnose by opening up the electrical cabinet. And I'll show you some things to check uh, that'll help you to figure out whether or not you have the right condensed unit on the roof. Because when you're working with uh, remote condensed units or multiplex systems that have multiple evaporators, sometimes it can be kind of difficult to figure out which one's which. Um, you, can, you can cycle temperature controllers and watch the unit turn on and off. You can, uh, in this case, this is a walk-in freezer. Now I know the sequence of operation on this unit. The power for the evaporator is controlled from the rooftop, so that disconnect will shut off the evaporator. You can shut that off you know, there's a bunch of different methods. All right, I went ahead and pulled the covers off just so I can get access to everything. Now, let me point something out. Refrigerant pressures mean absolutely nothing to me when you have an iced up evaporator, okay? Obviously, if I did check it, I would have extremely low superheat. And the reason why we would have extremely low superheat, the ice is preventing the air from completing the heat transfer process passing through the evaporator. So we're not boiling off the little vapor particles and I'm sorry, uh, liquid particles coming out of the expansion valve, you know, cause it's like a liquid vapor mixture blowing into the evaporator and it's coming directly back up to the uh, compressor. So we're gonna have extremely low superheat. So you never trust uh, you, or you never put your service gauges. There's no point, okay? Until after you've defrosted it completely. Uh, same thing for a flashing sight glass. It means nothing when you have a totally iced up evaporator coil. In this particular situation, now there's some systems, but on a, on a typical walk-in freezer, it's, it's not gonna do nothing. The next thing is, is coming into the electrical section, just kind of doing a visual inspection, just to see if we see anything jumping out at us. It's still energized, okay? Um, I have not checked any voltages yet, but we know that we have voltage because we've heard it cycle. Coming up to our defrost clock, and look at that. Pretty common but we've got a short on the uh, defrost terminal. That's the number three terminal. So that's the electric heat for the defrost uh, circuit. So essentially I can make an assumption that this thing's never going into defrost. Even if the clock is still initiating a defrost, the wire's shorted out. 
Now, it's hard to say exactly what caused that. A very common cause of a melted terminal like that is a loose electrical connection. Now, here's the difficult thing. Once it shorts out like it has, it's, it's kind of arced and kind of welded itself. There's all kinds of weird stuff going on in there. So it's almost impossible to figure out if it was actually loose or not. Sometimes you can tell, but a lot of times the screw is gonna weld itself to the little electrical connector. And you know, you're never gonna know, but that's a very common cause of, of a short like that or a, a burnt out terminal on a defrost clock is loose terminals. So at this point, there's nothing else we can do until we replace that defrost clock, turned off power, we'll double check, and uh, then we'll go down and defrost the evaporator coil. All right, we're just gonna double check voltage is off. It's a three phase system, so I'm gonna check all three phase to phase dead and then I'll check all three phase to ground dead 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 all three phase to ground so um, now I know the operation of this unit so I know that this disconnect right here controls power downstairs um, we still uh, um, need to verify just double check downstairs to make sure power is disconnected but that's where we're gonna go so um, I'm gonna go grab me a defrost clock we're gonna get this actually swapped out first so I have a new defrost clock these are very common this is a Paragon 814520 uh, it can come in 115 or 208 the last two digits the 20 designates 208 volts so you know, I hear a lot of people talking, oh, use Grazon, oh, use Paragon, oh, use Digital. I use every single one. It just, I'm not, I'm not in it to change everything. If it has a Paragon, I'm gonna throw a Paragon back in. You know, I, I see benefits to both. So, for the most part, I just try to put back in what's in there. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. Typically pull the clock out, put the new one in, and then just do a wire for wire. Whoever invented flathead screws, I've said this before, you're an idiot. You should have been smart and invented the Phillips anyway. In my region, walk-in freezer is going to have four defrost with a fail-safe time of 28 minutes. Defrost termination switches will usually take care of the rest and it'll usually terminate defrost before the 28 minute mark. So the way these clocks work is um, pretty simple. You can just pull the back from apart and see the mechanical components. And when it goes into defrost, it takes power from this terminal and this terminal because of the jumper. And each of those acts as your switching leg. So uh, one powers the clock. In is the other side of power. That completes the circuit so the clock will run. Two is actually your common for your switch leg. Two switches between three and four, and that's why there's a jumper there, so we can bring one source of power in. X is your defrost termination, so in the middle of a defrost, if everything's working right, we can terminate defrost via temperature. So what we're gonna do is just kind of wire for wire until we get to the wires that are screwed up, and then we'll figure those ones out. Here we go. And this is my burnt wire, so we're going to have to put a new connector on that. Hopefully I got one in my bag. I use the Vito Backpack or Tech Pack. And uh, usually, it looks like I got a whole plethora of stuff in here today, but keep a couple little connectors in here. Save me some headaches. There'll be uh, links to all the tools that I use in the show notes. So we might get lucky and find that there's enough slack in the wires to work with. So I don't have to go get a bunch of extra crap. Yeah, looks like we'll be good. Kind of go back, make sure you can find a spot where the wire's not burnt. That looks good. Yeah, you can tell too when you have a bad wire that when you strip it, it becomes problematic. You can kind of feel the burnt crap. Uh, I like these, I don't know, I mean, for Milwaukee, you know, it's Milwaukee crimpers, they work good. All right, so here's the deal. I don't want to energize this circuit yet because 
I'm pretty sure it was a loose connection, but what happens if there's an electrical short or something grounded downstairs? So we're gonna do, let's turn our meter, check continuity. We're gonna find a good ground right down here. There we go. Make sure we have good ground. Let's check continuity, see if anything's grounded out. Nothing's grounded out, everything's good. So, I feel pretty safe. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this guy back on. Hopefully nothing blows up in my face. I'm gonna stand away from the electrical panel when I turn it on, just to be safe. Put my glasses on. Okay, power's back on. It's running in cooling mode right now. Let's go ahead and check for proper voltage. 203.6, 202, 203, and I think I got everything, double check one more time. Yeah, so we have uh, three-phase power, 208 volts, basically, 203. Um, we're gonna go ahead and check for proper clock operation. So one to N powers the clock, 201 volts. N to three should have nothing at the moment. We're getting a little back feed. I see that sometimes through the limit switches. Uh, N to four is 201. N to X. Yeah, we're getting some sort of a back feed through the limit switches is what we're getting. Um, but I don't think that's a short. So let's go ahead and uh, again, turn our face away and we're gonna pop this guy into defrost and see what happens. We just went into defrost. Now this unit has a compressor contactor and a defrost contactor. It will not allow, because of this uh, interlock switch right here on the side of this compressor contactor, will not allow this defrost contactor to pull in until the compressor contactor pulls out. So essentially, it's looking for the system to pump down and go off on low pressure, and then the defrost contactor just pulled in. So now, if we check between N and three, we should have 208 volts or 199. Ooh, it kind of looks like we're getting a voltage drop. N to four, we got nothing. So let's do N to one. Oh, maybe not. 200 volts. Wow, are we getting really low voltage in this place right now? Let's check down here again. 204. 202. 204. So we are getting. 201, 202. So I guess that's not the end of the world. Let's see. One, 201, 200. I guess that's accurate. And then, yeah, I guess I guess that's right. So our heater circuit is now energized. So um, what we can do is check the amps on the number three wire going downstairs. We'll go down and test the heaters too. But we find the number three wire going downstairs. And that should be this guy right here. Put on amps. We've only got three amps downstairs. That's not good for a heater circuit. We're missing a heater. Something's up there. All right, so we know there's an electrical problem because we should have much higher amperage. I mean, I don't know the number right off the top of my head, but we should have at least eight, nine amps, I would think, because there's typically uh, three or four heaters in those things. Uh, I also need a new battery in my meter, but... Um, okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and de-energize now and go check out what's going on down there. We gotta defrost it first, and then we'll go through the steps. Okay, I completely removed the motors from the picture, fan guards off. Side panels off, we got that one off. I'm still need to take this one off and we're gonna go ahead and use water. We're gonna defrost this very carefully without getting any water on the ground. Uh, this walk-in has a raised floor. We, like I say a million times, you can't get water underneath the raised floor or it'll freeze and lift up, so. Nice and slow. I love my wand. Uh, this thing, I've showed it a million times. I got it from Lowe's. 
Um, this thing does a really good job of being able to get in there. I put it on the shower function and go to town with hot water. So we'll get this defrosted and then check back in. We got the evaporator defrosted all the way over here, the expansion valve section. I even got the suction line. If there's some insulation falling off, we'll get that fixed. Over in the electrical section, we got everything going on over here. We got three limit switches, so this one doesn't use combination switches. So we've got a heater safety up here. This has probably got to be the fan delay because it's up towards the top. And this one, no, maybe this is the fan delay. I don't remember. One of these is a fan delay. One of them is defrost termination. I guess I can stare at the wires and figure it out. But anyways, um, because I wasn't getting amperage like all my heaters were running, I'm going to go ahead and ohm out the heaters individually since I have the voltage off and test to see if we have any issues. 37 ohms on that one. So let's do the other one. There's only two heaters in here. There's one at the bottom of the coil and one in the middle of the coil, so we'll test the other one real quick. Interesting, that one's getting 37 ohms too. And this is the top heater. Huh. So these are electric strip heaters. That's very interesting, but yet I was only getting like three amps. Maybe we got something going on in a limit switch. We'll see, we'll investigate a little bit further. All right, it's not the end of the world, but you know, I cleaned off the ice off the accumulator and the suction line just kind of, it was all loose because I'd been defrosting it for so long. And I noticed that this whole accumulator was covered in oil. So it's a good thing. It's, you're not gonna be able to see it now because it's all on my towel, but I noticed that this dryer is pretty rusted out on the top. We'll definitely be doing a leak check. Um, yeah, there's, I'm sure there's gonna be a leak somewhere. It could just be a bad uh, Schrader cap. Those things all leak all the time too. Who knows, but this equipment's getting pretty old, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, get ready to fire this guy up and then gauge up. All right, we're getting ready to turn it on. I came down here to do one more final check to make sure there's no wires in the way of the fan blades or anything. So this thing has a fan delay limit switch over here. Um, so the evaporator fan motor should not turn on until the evaporator temperature gets somewhere around 20-ish degrees, then it'll turn them on. Um, so I will be upstairs when that happens and then we got to let the coil get cold enough Because it also has a defrost termination switch currently right now. I think my box temp is about 36 degrees so we need this uh, coil to get cold enough that it will allow it to go into defrost too before we can test any further What's going on with the heaters? So at this point we're gonna got some gauges on the unit We're gonna go ahead and turn it on lean to the side fires it up and we gotta wait for the evaporator fan motors to turn on. Usually you can see it because your suction uh, temperature will go down really low, your evaporator temperature will be really low. And it takes a few minutes for the, uh, the fans usually to turn on, but we'll see. Um, our current, we've got box temp on this too. Our current box temp is 35 degrees right now. And it'll actually probably warm up a little bit, so. Let's see what happens. Let it run for a few minutes and then we'll slap it back into defrost and test it. All right, the evaporator fan motors are running. So now we're gonna let it run for a few minutes and uh, bring the box temp down and then we'll put it back into defrost and test all the heaters and see what's going on. All right, my box temp is about 21 degrees. I feel pretty confident that we can go ahead and slap this guy into defrost and we should get a, uh, we should be able to click it in and you know, it not click out. Um, again, turning my face away. We gotta watch the pump down. So you're gonna see the suction line pump down. Okay. Defrost heater pulled in, or contactor pulled in. Let's go ahead and check some voltages here. All right, so one to N is 201 volts. N to three. 201 volts and to four should be nothing correct okay so we are in defrost now so let's see what our amperage is or our current is it should be this guy 10 amps interesting that we weren't pulling 10 amps earlier see earlier what were we only pulling like five or something like that Makes me think one of the heaters wasn't working. Something was going on there, a limit switch or something funky. Hmm, 
very, very interesting. I'm also gonna start, I started a stopwatch, so we have a fail safe time of about 28 minutes. And I got a stopwatch going on my watch right now. So um, if, uh, if we don't terminate defrost before then, then we know uh, something's going on here because this thing uh, with the box temp inside there, the defrost termination switch should easily terminate defrost before the 30 minute timer. All right, um, let's see, 5.26 amps on one of the circuits. And here's the other circuit, 5.35 amps. So they're both working now. So it's interesting if you guys remember at the beginning of the video, I put it in defrost and we weren't running anywhere near that. Hmm, see I don't know what's going on. Both of these guys are powered at the same time. The only thing I did was pull the electrical connectors off and ohm them out and put them back on. So I guess they could have had bad connections, but you would think there would be signs of heat or anything if it was a bad electrical connection for the heater. It's very interesting. I'm leaning towards a limit switch because I didn't come down here because I couldn't because it was all frozen up. These limit switches have a really high failure rate. Um, I'm leaning towards a limit switch being a problem and messing with the defrost somehow. I'm gonna show you guys a trick if you want to know if your defrost heaters are working correctly or if there's a problem with them, if you have the manufacturer's information. So check this out. It's a 208, 230 volt circuit, and it says the heater circuit should run at 13 amps. So what you could simply do is take an Ohm's law calculator and input the highest voltage, 230 volts, and the amps. Now this one has two heaters, right? So I'm going to split that in two. So I'm going to take 230 volts and six and a half amps and I'll input it in an ohms lock calculator and it'll tell you what the ohms of that heater should be and you can compare that to what you're measuring to see if you have an issue. All right, what I'm gonna do is open up an ohms lock calculator and it comes with some generic numbers in there. So we're gonna input the voltage of 230 volts, that's the maximum. And then the only other, we only have to know two things to figure out the Ohm's law calculation, right? We said uh, 13 amps was the total amps, but we're going to split it between two heaters. So we're going to go here, change it to amps, and we're going to do 6.5 and then hit calculate. And it says our resistance value of each heater should be approximately 35 ohms. And that's right about where we were. So I don't see anything too alarming with that. Um, but so I don't think there's anything wrong with the heaters per se. Now that we did that, we're going to, uh, everything's running. And it's also possible that, you know, those, both those heaters aren't exactly identical in resistance value. They might be one that's a little bit more than the other one, but they're somewhat the same. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the heaters. I think the heaters are fine. Unless there's a bad connection here. That one's loose though. It's missing the, uh, the hanger strap. I can feel it dangling. But yeah, we're good. So we're just now just waiting for the timer. We're at nine minutes now. We're waiting for it to um, time out on defrost termination. While I'm waiting for this thing to kick out a defrost, I'm just checking this thermostat and check this out. It's not working. Turn it all the way off. Turn it all the way on. It's not you don't hear the actuation. It's not clicking. It's definitely not below negative 20 in here, and it's definitely not above 100 degrees in here. So it's not shutting off. Well, that's no bueno. Well, so what we're gonna do, this thing's set for as cold as it'll go. We have an open circuit. It's funny, because when I first turned it, it clicked, but it clicked in a weird spot, and then it didn't do it again, so it's like it just went bad. I don't know that that would cause the freeze up issue, but big picture diagnosis, it was going bad. It's weird. It's like it terminated defrost, but it didn't, I haven't heard the cooling cycle kick on. I guess it could be because of that thermostat, but. So we definitely terminated defrost. We'll go up there and check out the clock. All right, so we're back up on the roof. Um, check the clock real quick. One to end. 203 volts into 4 204 volts into 3 nothing so uh, compressor contactors not pulled in and uh, defrost contactors not pulled in 
but that thermostat being open won't let it energize the solenoid valve because the thermostat's open so it's just got multiple problems so we're gonna have to change that thermostat out and then finish going through everything all right i removed the old temperature controller which was right there relocated it to a much better location back here and then just ran the sensing bulb and put it in the middle of the coil that way and basically you got to make sure it's off the wall the way it's getting more air temp i mean ideally it's suspended in the air but yeah it's kind of difficult and i just tied it in over here so um that way people don't mess with it i also have a cap to put on that when it comes time so we're going to go back up on the roof and uh finish our diagnosis let's try this again see what happens there we go pressure came up solenoid valves open so we're gonna watch the box come down in temp this is a very interesting one because like I said when I first came up here I put it in defrost and I amped it out and it was not running it was barely any amps which was interesting hmm. so I'm thinking there might be something going on with the limit switches is my thought but anyway, so we got the defrost clock changed out. Thermostat, we found that too, changed that out. So now we're gonna watch it come down in temp. Well, everything seems to be working okay. I just came back from a lunch. It's come down in temp quite a bit. We'll jump on the roof and look at the numbers right now, but I'm gonna start putting the panels back together in this guy. So the receiver is only about just under half. Yeah, I can feel it with my hands. I'm using my hand right now. And basically the liquid level feels to be about right here which is where it's showing on the thermal imaging camera too so we need to put a little more refrigerant in this system just to be a hundred percent sure my system is pumped down and what I'm doing is is just uh, adding refrigerant while it's still pumped down very slowly into the accumulator so that way we're not overloading the compressor and instead of going through the whole process of pumping it down again I'm just bringing the pressure up very slowly to be very careful you don't want to slug your compressor but the accumulator is helping me out because I have that here and I'm putting it in through a Schrader port so it's already barely gonna be any liquid by the time it goes into a Schrader port and then it's you know changing state in the accumulator or just boiling off basically or whatever but um, yeah just adding a little bit of refrigerant and then we'll check the liquid level again look at it the thermal camera I'm gonna change it over right now looks like we're just about at the three-quarter mark so I'm gonna call it good there um, yeah we're gonna call it good there and see what that does the whole reason why I filled the receiver up to the three-quarter mark is because when my systems operating right now my head pressure control valve is not bypassing at all okay I had a hunch that we might have a refrigerant leak on top of everything else that's wrong with this. Uh, there was oil all over the accumulator when I took the ice off and then also um, some of the service caps. I can actually tell you they're leaking right now because there's I can just see when I pulled the caps off they were oily. So I had a hunch we were low on refrigerant. Now because the head pressure control valve is not bypassing I have no way of knowing how much refrigerant's in the system at this moment. So the easiest way in my opinion, I'm not the smartest genius in the world but this is the way that I roll is I'm gonna put the maximum amount of refrigerant into that system and the only way that I can do that is by filling that receiver up to the maximum capacity when it's pumped down which is three quarters of a receiver all right so I used the thermal camera it showed that it was like in the halfway range and then I added some refrigerant and brought it up just under the three-quarter mark that's all I'm gonna to add to it for now um, we're gonna go ahead and turn this system back on and I'm actually gonna get out of here because it's Saturday and I've been here all day as it is. All right, we had a bunch of stuff going on with this one, but it started out as a walk-in freezer that wasn't working properly. When I arrived, I found that the evaporator was iced up really good, okay? And immediately I found that the defrost clock, the number three terminal on that particular clock was uh, melted and the wire was just about burnt off completely. That's why the unit wasn't defrosting, but there was some other stuff going on there too. Um, once I got it all defrosted, uh, you know, I kind of walked you guys through some steps and 
uh, it was very strange because I put the defrost clock in there and it wasn't getting the proper uh, current draw or amperage for the heaters when they were running. It was really weird. I saw, I think it was like three something amps or four something amps. And it should have been much higher than that. And I kind of guessed what I thought it was, but I think it was supposed to be about 10 amps or something like that. So it was very strange and I couldn't duplicate that problem again, okay? But also, if you remember when I was testing the defrost clock after I replaced it, I was also getting some weird like back feed um, through the limit switches is what I thought because I was getting some weird voltages from three to N when the unit was in the freeze mode. So it makes me think, or made me think that there was an issue with the limit switches. Now, also found that the unit had a bad thermostat, and that's that's another one too. That happened while I was there, you know, because I turned the thermostat just to see how accurate it was, to see where it was clicking at versus the box temperature, and I heard it click once, but it clicked in a really weird spot as far as temperature, and then it wouldn't click again. So the thermostat literally failed after I turned it. You know, big picture diagnosis, like I always say, not my fault, but had I not turned that thermostat, more than likely I would have gotten a service call within the next few days when the thermostat failed on its own. So, you know, always go through as much as you can. You know, it's a fine line between spending too much time in parking there and, you know, being thorough. That's a hard one. You got to kind of, you know, evaluate that yourself, talk with your managers and different things. But big picture diagnosis always, guys. OK, so um, I got them up and running. I changed the defrost clock. I changed the thermostat and I'm going to talk to the customer now. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think that the customer is going to authorize any more repairs on that unit. This customer, as I've said many other times in my videos, likes to change equipment. This equipment was from 2002. I do not see them having me do a leak search and a leak repair on this unit. Um, if it was a giant leak, yes, I would have fixed it that day. But being that it was, it was only five pounds short, it took five pounds to fill the receiver up to the three quarter mark. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think they're going to, but again, uh, I'm going to contact them and basically give them all the options and see where they want to go. All right. Um, another thing that I did was I checked the liquid level in the receiver and I've talked about that many times. All right. I really didn't elaborate as to what I was doing when I was doing it in the video, but I pumped the system down after I was all done to check the liquid level because we typically leave them at the three quarter mark unless otherwise it's marked with a paint marker. Okay. This one had no paint marker. So I know that it should have been at the three quarter pumped down level and it wasn't, it was a little bit below half. So I went ahead and added five pounds of gas to the system, got it up to the three quarter mark just because that wasn't the problem while I was there, but I didn't want, uh, when it got really cold outside one night, uh, for it to be starved for refrigerant because the head pressure control valve tries to bypass. All right. So I checked the level, filled up the receiver to the maximum amount, um, which is the three quarter. And that's where I left the customer. Um, and you know, I basically just presented everything to them. Uh, also I think when I got there, I think the box was in the forties and I think when I left, it was just below 20 degrees, maybe 15 degrees or something like that was where I left it. And it's since been a day. And, uh, cause this, this call was the, uh, yesterday. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, you know, customers happy and everything for now. And it's just a temporary fix. Um, Really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Uh, you know, I've been plugging it in every single one of my outros. I'm starting a new YouTube channel. It's called HVACR Tools. There'll be a link in the top of the show notes right here. I'd really appreciate if you guys go over there and uh, give me a subscription. I plan to start uploading to that channel um, right after the first of the year. We'll start uploading videos. I don't know if it's going to be as regular as this channel, but we definitely will upload content. It's going to be a different spin on tool reviews, guys. It's going to be my spin. It's going to be my way. Nobody's telling me how to do it. Um, you know, I'm still figuring things out, but you know, I like to do things my way and I really don't want to be told what to do. So that's the kind of channel that I want it to be. It's going to be on the tools that I want to review. So Keep an eye out for that. Um, also, uh, live streams. You know, I do live streams every Monday evening, work permitting, as long as I can get off work in time. Uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time on my YouTube channel where I usually answer questions and address things that I forgot to mention in the videos. Come check it out, guys. Really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to watch these. And I guess that's it. Other than that, we will uh, catch you guys on the next one, okay?